Thank you, Sue, and good morning. It is indeed a great privilege to be here and to have the honour of giving an oration in honour of a man who, by all accounts, was particularly focused on the fact that events early in life change health for the rest of life and indeed for our nation as a whole. So it seemed appropriate that in choosing a topic to talk about, I should focus on the, the lifelong legacies of events around the time of birth. Events around the time of birth because I'm a neonatologist and a fetal physiologist and because it has become clear as our focus has shifted more from mortality to morbidity in our care for young babies that we are facing dilemmas and trade-offs of a kind that we have not until recently understood and indeed we still don't understand sufficiently to optimize our treatment. So what I'd like to do this morning is give you just five examples of areas of treatment, of management around the time of birth that pose dilemmas and offer trade-offs that we need to understand in order to optimize outcome. We have known about being born small for a very long time. We know that being born small, either because you're preterm or because you haven't grown well, is associated with an increased mortality. This isn't new, and you could argue that being alive is a lifelong legacy in itself. But what about more important, perhaps, lifelong things like cerebral palsy? The top lines are preterm babies, the bottom lines are term-born babies, and this is the relationship between the incidence of cerebral palsy and birth weight Z score. So again, both gestation and birth weight have important implications for lifelong health. But it was probably this man, David Barker, in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s that really focused many of our attention on events before birth and long-term health consequences. This is just one of his early papers of which there were a large number showing that there is a relationship between size at birth, in this case in pounds, because these babies were born in the 1920s, and the incidence of coronary heart disease age 65. The relationship is strong. It is across the range of birth weight. And he went on to show, he and others went on to show, in what is now called the developmental origins hypothesis, that events before birth disturb fetal growth is related to a large number of the chronic diseases of adulthood that we have come to recognize as the morbidities that we deal with. But it's not just, and at the time that Barker was working, it was assumed that that small size at birth was related to fetal growth rather than to gestational age. But it, more recently, it's become obvious that actually gestational age is equally important, if not more important. This is the relationship between gestation and the risk of diabetes in adulthood. And this is across the range of term birth weights, term gestations. So this isn't very preterm. This is across the range of term gestations. And in our own study, there's almost a linear relationship between glucose tolerance at age 30 and gestational age back as far as about 30 weeks. Each of the little spots along the bottom is an individual. So it's clear that gestational age is important and it's about as important as growth, at least in blood pressure on this study. Again, the quintiles of birth weight, so growth from the smallest babies at the top to the largest babies at the bottom, and across the range of term gestations, a very marked effect on blood pressure in adulthood. We've also shown that preterm birth in itself is associated with increased weight. On the top, the gray bars are the uh, are the adults born preterm. This is studied in their mid-30s, and you can see that there's increased risk of overweight and obesity. If we look more carefully at this group, those born preterm on the left, those born at term on the right, the adults and their children born at term, you can see that the increased weight is due to increased truncal fat in the adults and in their children. So here's a lifelong legacy that continues to the next generation. But of course, we have a trade-off here, don't we? Why do people get born preterm across the range of term gestations? Well, many of them get born preterm 
because we decide that there's a trade-off to be had. In this case, between the risk of stillbirth in the red line across the range of term gestations and the risk of neonatal death in the blue line. And we're trading those things off in deciding at what gestation would be the appropriate to deliver this baby. What we're doing in that trade-off, we need to understand in terms of its context for lifelong health implications of the sort that I've just shown you. Our second example is to do with antenatal glucocorticoids. And of course, I need to talk about antenatal glucocorticoids because I work at the Liggins Institute and I had the privilege of knowing well Professor Sir Graham Mont Liggins, here on my left, your right, who until his death last year was a very, active involve, very actively involved in our research activities. And Mont and his colleague, Ross Howie, who is a colleague of my own, showed in 1972 that antenatal glucocorticoids would reduce the risk of mortality and morbidity in babies born preterm. So why was it in 1992, 20 years later, that the Cochrane Collaboration adopted this logo, which for those of you who don't know, is the meta-analysis, the systematic review of the effect of antenatal steroids, with the top little tiny line being the Liggins and Howey trial from 1972. They adopted that logo 20 years later because antenatal steroids were still not in widespread use. And they felt that if the information had been made more clearly available, perhaps that would have changed things. I don't know if it would. We know, we knew then and we know now, that antenatal steroids reduce the risk of fetal death by about 20%. They reduce the risk of respiratory distress syndrome, and these are divided by decades. So the trials done in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we're still doing trials in the 2000s, and they still show the same result. Not many people, on the other hand, are aware that antenatal steroids also prevent cerebral palsy and developmental delay. This is a substantial benefit, 40 to 50% decrease. That's a pretty good output for a preventative treatment. So why don't we use it more? Because we've been worried about the long-term side effects. So here's the reverse. Here's a treatment we know works. We're not using in some places because we're worried there might be a trade-off. So we set out to find out if there was, in fact, a trade-off for later health. And Stuart Dalziel on your left did all the work. He's speaking later this morning, I notice. Uh, Ross Howie and Mont Liggins kindly lent us all of the data and David Barker sat around smiling because he was sure that it was obvious that the answer would be that there was a significant long-term effect on health. I just stood around in the middle. Stuart did all the work. We set out to try and discover if exposure to antenatal steroids did change any of the long-term potential health outcomes that had been hypothesized to be due to exposure to fetal corticosteroids. We had locked in a room in a cupboard at the end of the hallway the original records of the 1972 trial, beautifully handwritten, and we knew the name of the mother and the sex and date of birth of the baby. That's all. But New Zealand's a small place, and you can find 30-year-olds if you try hard enough, and where are 30-year-old Kiwis? Well, they're all over the country, and they're all over the world. But they were prepared to contribute to a very large study. We saw 534 of them, and the short answer is that there were no adverse effects on any of these long-term outcomes as a result of prenatal exposure to glucocorticoids, and nor were there any effects on any of these things. So was there no trade-off? Well, actually, there was a small trade-off. This is the response to a glucose tolerance test, and the ones in orange, those exposed to glucocorticoids, have a very small increased insulin response to a glucose load they appear to be very mildly insulin resistant. And when we've looked in more detail, the same cohort I showed you before, now age 35, you can see that in the adults on the left-hand columns, those exposed to steroids have a reduced insulin sensitivity, and so do their children on the right. So there is a long-term consequence. There is a trade-off to be had. On the other hand, a 40 to 50% decrease in cerebral palsy, some people might argue, is a small price to pay to have a very small change in insulin sensitivity, age 30. 
of absolutely no clinical significance at age 30. We don't yet know if they'll get diabetes in their 60s or 70s. So what about repeat steroids? Again, our behavior has been slightly anomalous, I think, in considering trade-offs. We've known for years, from, at least from studies in sheep, that more doses gives you better lungs. And we've also known that more doses gives you lower birth weight because glucocorticoids inhibit growth, amongst other things. And I've just spent some time telling you that lower birth weight's associated with adverse long-term health consequences. So is this a problem for repeat doses of steroids? Well, there have now been some eight trials involving some 5,000 children where we have clear evidence on the top line of a reduction in RDS and of composite serious morbidity. So we have a clear short-term benefit of repeat doses of glucocorticoids. You might not want to go with that. You might say, well, let's have a look at them when they're a bit bigger. And here are the two to three-year-olds, four trials reported, absolutely no effect on any of these outcomes. How long do you want to wait to use a treatment with a clear neonatal benefit? Well, you could wait until they're six to eight, and you still have absolutely no adverse effects. Ah, but you will say to me, what about the metabolic effects, those other chronic diseases that we've been looking for that weren't there after a single dose? Well, as far as we can tell, they're not there after multiple doses either, at least up to six to eight. But repeat doses of glucocorticoids are not being widely used because people are still worried about long-term consequences. So one of the dilemmas for us, I think, is at what point do we think there is enough evidence of short-term benefit to risk potential long-term trade-offs. In this case, if you look at the number needed to treat, it's really not very different from single and repeat doses. But we are using one with some concern and not using the other yet. To move on to perinatal anemia, I got interested in this area because at a conference I was at a few years ago, there were data presented about the effects of fetal anemia on the sheep heart. And the reason that was being presented was the fundamental argument that we make our hearts before we're born, by and large. By and large, you don't make any more cardiomyocytes after you're born, they only get bigger. So if you're building your heart, you're doing it before you're born, and if things provide different stressors to the fetal heart, then that might permanently change cardiac structure and function. Now we know fetal anemia is a significant stressor of the fetal cardiovascular system. This is the effect of seven days of anemia in a fetal sheep, and you can see that blood flow, particularly to the heart, increases enormously, much more so than to any other vascular bed. And in fact, if you look at coronary conductance, which one can loosely translate if you're not a cardiologist, is something about the coronary tree, then it's the, it's the flow at maximal vasodilatation, so it tells you something about coronary tree. And you can see that in the left, two left-hand bars, compared with the control fetus, the anemic fetus has a doubled coronary conductance after just one week of anemia. And if you study them as adults, the two right-hand bars, you can see that that doubling is still there. So just one week of fetal anemia in sheep doubles coronary conductance for the rest of that animal's life. I thought that's very interesting. Does it happen in people? Because if it did, that might be important. And after much debate, we decided that we could, in fact, answer that question because rhesus disease used to be a very common cause of fetal anemia where a rhesus-negative mother produces antibodies that cross the placenta and cause anemia in her rhesus-positive fetus. And of course, treatment for, fetal, for rhesus disease was first initiated by Sir William Lyley at National Women's Hospital in the 1960s. He was working with Mont Liggins. And by scurrying around in the same way as we did for the original Liggins records, we found the original Lyley records, labeled Fetal Anemia Transfusion Book One. And you can see in his handwriting how he describes the procedures to give transfusions to anemic fetuses. 
So we set about finding adults who had been transfused for severe fetal rhesus disease and matching them with their unaffected siblings to determine whether there were in fact long-term cardiovascular consequences of being anemic as a fetus in humans. Alex Wallace did this study and you can see that we studied nearly 200 people well matched at about 35 to 40 years of age. So not yet having cardiovascular disease, but certainly old enough to have cardiovascular risk factors. And compared with their unaffected siblings, those who had been treated for fetal anemia were very similar in all of these outcomes. They did well as a group, but they did have cardiovascular risk factors. Here are the white bars of the affected siblings. And you can see compared with their unaffected siblings, they have smaller hearts. On the left-hand bars, they have reduced HDL, and they have a higher LF to HF ratio, which is an, an, uh, a reflection of heart rate variability that implies a sympathetic overload, so an increased sympathetic versus parasympathetic balance. All of those things are clear risk factors for coronary heart disease, as are the fact that they actually have reduced myocardial blood flow as adults. So we have clear evidence from humans that in fact being anemic as a fetus has long-term consequences. That's important for those people. They may, may need to know that they are at risk. It may be important for the tre future treatment of fetal anemia, but I think it's really important for preterm babies who all get anemic at a time that they're still building their hearts, at the same time that these fetuses were still in utero. So what happens to preterm babies and anemia? Because we treat that anemia. If we treated it better, we might prevent some of these effects. It's very hard to sort that out in people, not impossible, but pretty hard. So we've done some initial studies in sheep. This is a preterm lamb. It's helped us with our studies. And in sheep, when you can separate the effects of prematurity from the effects of anemia, and look at them as adults, you can see that on the left are the term controls. The yellow bars are the preterm lambs so that they have an increased LF to HF ratio, so sympathetic overload again. Being anemic if you're a term lamb increases your sympathetic activity, the blue stripes. And strangely enough, if you're a preterm lamb and you're anemic, you decrease that activity in a way that I don't yet understand but you do have long-term consequences for coronary conductance if you're born preterm and then become anemic. So understanding some of these trade-offs, understanding the physiology behind them might allow us to manage preterm anemia in a way that would improve long-term cardiovascular health. Neonatal nutrition. This is perhaps the area that is best understood in terms of having potential and long-term implications, but I'm going to suggest to you that we don't understand anything like enough. The early work, Barker's group, and this is the Finns, the Finnish studies from the 1990s, showed very clearly that things like coronary heart disease in adulthood are related both to fetal growth and to childhood growth. So on the the um, right-hand axis uh, is ponderal index at birth from the skinny babies at back to the thin babies in the front. Sorry, other way around. Skinny babies at the back, fat babies at the front. And along the, the other axis is body mass index age 11 from the skinny children on the right to the fat children on the left. And you can see that if you're born chubby, that is the front bars, it doesn't matter too much if you get fat as you get older. It doesn't change your risk of coronary heart disease very much. On the other hand, if you get born skinny, the bars at the back, then getting fat by the time you're 11 markedly increases your risk of later coronary heart disease. So we have an interaction here between growth before birth and growth after birth. Is that related to nutrition? Well, it's not yet clear. Well, I'm going to show you some evidence, but. It's now clear that in preterm babies, the effect on later cardiovascular function is very, very quick to occur. This is the relationship between weight gain in the first two weeks in very preterm babies and their subsequent 
vasodilatation so that the babies who grew rapidly in the first two weeks have impaired vasodilatation as they get older. And this kind of data has led people to make suggestions that maybe we should be restricting the growth of small babies in the first few weeks after birth. I think that's really scary because we are beginning to understand the trade-offs involved. And this is nicely illustrated in the US preterm birth study. Those children are now in their adulthood. And this has shown that, in this case, the example I've given you is that an increase of Z score for length in the first four months. So very preterm babies who grew better in the first four months. They had about a 20% increase in the risk of being overweight or obese at age eight and at age 18. So they are likely to be overweight or obese for life. On the other hand, they've got a 20% decrease in the risk of having an IQ less than 85. So there are very clear trade-offs in terms of growth for preterm babies. And our challenge now that we understand those trade-offs is can we minimize the metabolic risks while maximizing the intellectual outcomes? And there's some evidence that we may be able to do this. Again, I've gone to lamb studies. These are lambs given a fortifier, very similar to the fortifier we use in preterm babies, just for two weeks. Born preterm, given fortifier for two weeks, and looked at in adulthood. The left-hand graphs are lean mass, and the right-hand graphs are fat mass as adults. And you can see that males in the blue bars have more lean mass than females, but those given supplements have much more lean mass than those given water. And likewise, they have less fat mass on the right-hand side. And it's a big effect. It's nearly the same effect as being male or female. The supplements did not change growth. So it wasn't because they grew fast, but it did improve their metabolic outcomes. Glucose area under the curve on the right-hand graphs, the blue ones are the supplemented, the orange ones were the non-supplemented. They have markedly improved metabolic outcomes, presumably related to less fat mass and more lean mass, although we didn't change their growth and we only gave them two weeks of treatment. We permanently change their pancreatic function. These are just a few of the genes involved in pancreatic beta cell function in a sex-specific way, so that the males were benefited, increased, ex increased expression of these genes, and the females were either not benefited or indeed perhaps slight adverse effect on these genes. And we improved their pancreatic beta cell size and structure, which is why their glucose tolerance was better, presumably. On the left-hand side, you can see that the supplemented animals had about twice as much beta cell mass in the blue, if they were males, nearly twice as much islet cell area, and twice as much beta cell mass. Not true in the females. So it appears that nutrition, really for quite brief periods, at least in the preterm, can have long-term benefits on metabolic outcomes as well as intellectual outcomes, although we did not assess intellectual outcomes in sheep, I have to rapidly tell you. But in people, where we know there is a trade-off to be had between metabolic and intellectual outcomes, we need to do much better in understanding the nutrition so that we can do the best for those trade-offs. And there's a lot of work to be done. And finally, to say a few words about neonatal glycemia, another area where we're beginning to understand the trade-offs of a treatment, but we have a great deal more to learn. Hyperglycemia, high blood glucose concentrations, are very common in very preterm babies. Something like 80% of babies less than 1,000 grams will have hyperglycemia. And that's associated with a number of adverse events, including retinopathy, IVH, um, brain hemorrhages, and sepsis. We've not been sure whether that relationship is causal. Are the small sick babies the ones that get hyperglycemic and also get all the bad outcomes, or does the hyperglycemia cause the bad outcomes? If it causes it, then treatment ought to be helpful. So in the HINT trial, this is Jane Alswheeler's work in our group, she randomized very preterm hyperglycemic babies to trying to maintain their glucose as near normal, the tight control, or to run at a higher and more liberal level most commonly used in, currently in treatment. 
And amongst other things, we showed that the tight glycemic control, keeping the glucose low by giving insulin, did increase weight gain, but actually decreased linear gain. So we made them fat. This may not be a good thing. We also doubled the incidence of hypoglycemia, and of course hypoglycemia is also associated with bad intellectual outcomes in preterm babies. So there may be a trade-off here. What kind of a trade-off? Ask me again in a couple of years, because this study is currently looking at those children age seven, and we will understand better what those trade-offs are. But in the meantime, we've again gone back to the lambs, here's Jane Ellswiller with her lambs, and says, well, is the hyperglycemia causal and does treatment help? So we've got four groups of lambs. The black and the blue ones are the controls, both term and preterm. The red ones are preterm lambs given glucose infusion to make them hyperglycemia for 12 days, only 12 days. And the green ones are made hyperglycemic and then given insulin to bring their glucose back down to normal as per clinical practice. When we look at those lambs, we find that indeed it seems the hyperglycemia is causing problems because the mortality is much higher in that group, most of it from sepsis. On the other hand, treating them with insulin increases the risk of hypoglycemia, just as we saw in the babies, and that may have important long-term consequences. What happens to their metabolic function, which we thought might be important? It turns out that being hyperglycemic as a neonate impairs your insulin secretion as an adult. This is the insulin response to a hyperglycemic clamp. The spike on the right-hand side is a response to an arginine bolus. And you can see that both control groups are on the top and the two hyperglycemic groups are on the bottom. They are unable to respond to mountain insulin response to that stimulus. And if we look at their pancreas, they have impaired expression of several of the genes involved in pancreatic development relative to controls. And if we look at their pancreatic beta cells, left hand of the term controls, being born preterm markedly inhibits beta cell proliferation, just being born preterm. Being made hyperglycemic as a neonate partially restores that, but it also markedly increases on the right-hand side the proportion of apoptosis, that is, cells that are dying. So you turn over your beta cells faster, but treatment partly ameliorates that effect. So there are trade-offs to be had for all of these treatments. Some of them we're having a handle on, some of them we don't. But in turning our focus from mortality to morbidity in our care of small babies, both before and after birth, we are needing increasingly to focus on the long-term consequences of those treatments. Being born small, we trade off the effect of stillbirth and the risk of neonatal mortality. That's fine, but we're also trading off a long-term metabolic risk. And particularly across the range of term gestations, those are things we should be thinking about with elective delivery. Antenatal glucocorticoids, we clearly have a reduction in neonatal morbidity. We have a reduction in cerebral palsy. We have evidence of a small increase in later metabolic risk in terms of insulin sensitivity, age 30, but no evidence of any increased risk of repeat steroids, yet we're still not using repeat steroids because we worry about the long-term risk. At some point, we have to say we have enough evidence to stop worrying too much about the long-term risks and trust that in 30 or 40, 50 years, somebody will have a better treatment for it anyhow. Perinatal anemia. In treating a fetus with anemia, we are indeed trading off survival against later cardiovascular risk, and I don't think any of us would have a problem with that. But if we understood the physiology, we could minimize those long-term risks, and particularly around anemia of prematurity, which is very much something we can manage. Neonatal nutrition, at least for preterm babies, there is a clear trade-off between intellectual and metabolic outcomes. In understanding better the mechanisms for those metabolic outcomes, we should be able to improve those without adversely affecting the intellectual outcomes, and that's a big challenge for neonatology. And finally, neonatal glycemia. We know that hyperglycemia is related to sepsis and to mortality, but treating it may 
increase the risk of adverse developmental effects because of the risk of hypoglycemia. And we need to understand the later metabolic risks in order to minimize that while we treat the neonatal problems. I'd like to close by thanking all of the people who actually do the work while I'm here talking to you, and to thank the college very much and all of my colleagues for the honor of being here today. Thank you very much.